read from the Pew Bible like you have in front of you. Chapter 5. Once you find it, let's stand up and let's read God's Word together. Otherwise, you can follow along on your tablets or whatever, but it's not going to be up on the screen. We will be referring to it, though. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Crowds of both men and women, as a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets and on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Father, this morning I thank you for your word. And this morning as we turn to it and, has, and have read it, we ask that you would breathe life into it. And as we expound the word of God this morning and we would see how that word applies to us in a personal way, Jesus, would you touch our lives and transform our lives? For we pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, just before I go and launch into the message this morning, we were singing Majesty and, and I was almost sort of transported back to the early 80s, and I, and I saw at the bottom that that song was written by Jack Hayford in 1981. And I remember worshipping the Lord back in 1981 in a church that was no wider than the sound booth, and about as long as this. We called it the Tin Temple. It was a tiny, tiny little church. Um, from there we moved into a bigger sanctuary because you know the, the church was growing and, and so we, we got rid of that but I remember singing that song clearly to the Lord worship his majesty and I, I was standing there and I remember my mom standing next to me hands lifted up praising the Lord that was one of her favorite songs worship his majesty and that's what it's all about is that we worship his majesty regardless of circumstances, regardless of difficulties that we face in life, regardless of what comes down the road in your life and my life, or whatever life, or whatever circumstance that we may face, we always need to be about worshipping the Lord. And so this morning, as we continue in our journey of the scary church in the book of Acts, we want to talk about thriving while threatened. And some of us don't really understand what that means to be threatened, but there are parts of the world today where people are being threatened simply because they love Jesus, simply because they've made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So far in the book of Acts, our journey has taken us, and we've seen how the Spirit of God empowered the early church, how it took those believers and brought them together and unified them and made them to have the same common belief, and that is their love that they had for the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of the circumstances, and we've seen how difficult it was for those early believers. And no matter what the circumstance was, they continued pressing in and knowing the Lord. We've seen that there are places today where there's tremendous persecution going on. And we also see that in the early church there was tremendous persecution going on. We see how the early believers were told not to preach the gospel. They were told by the religious authorities of the time, don't even mention the name of Jesus. Then we saw how Ananias and Sapphira within the church lied to the Holy Spirit and how God dealt with that situation. But this morning, we want to talk about how we can thrive while in being threatened by circumstances, by, by, by circumstances outside of us and maybe circumstances that are really close to us. How can we do that? None of us, I'm sure, this morning would say, sign me up, I want to be persecuted. Do we have any takers? No, of course not, because none of us want to go through a difficult time. And what is our definition? You see, I think living in the West, we have a different understanding of what persecution is. Sometimes we may say, well, we talk about Jesus and someone may snub us and say, well, don't talk about that name. And we think we're being persecuted. But there's something far greater as we see in the world unfolding before us, what persecution is. When we see what's happening in, in, in northern Iraq, we see the Christians being killed simply because they're Christian, simply because they follow the teachings of Scripture, simply because they are of a different faith. 
We see martyrdom happening today. We see it in North Korea. We see it in China. We see it in Africa. We see it all over how people are being killed under severe persecution simply because they're believers. We living here have no idea really what those believers are going through. Yes, we can read about it. And I, was, I read some things and saw some things this past week that really grabbed a hold of my heart and, and really burdened my heart for the persecuted church again and again and again. And it's throughout this week. Here in the U.S., I hear people complain how difficult it is being a Christian. We have no idea how difficult it is being a Christian in comparison to other parts of the world. And when I hear people complaining and griping, well, someone doesn't like me because I'm a believer, I said, shame. Poor you. When in comparison to what's going on in the rest of the world. And when we read the book of Acts, we are reminded how powerful the church of Jesus Christ is, even in the midst of persecution. And we know from early church history how the believers were persecuted right from the word go. And even in the face of severe persecutions, the believers kept their faith. They were faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ because they experienced Him firsthand. They knew the reality of their faith. There were mighty miracles that the apostles were doing. And these were the miracles in fulfillment to what Jesus had said, that greater works than these you will do. Look what Jesus said to them in, in the 14th chapter of John. He said, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And you will do whatever, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, this is a promise. This is an open promise that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his followers. You see, when Jesus performed miracles, he had three purposes in mind. And what were these purposes? Number one, it was to show compassion and meet human need. It was to reach out and touch people's lives and meet a need. There's a desperate need. The second one was to show his credentials as being the very Son of God that He was the Messiah, that He was the one that Israel was waiting for. He was the one that the Scriptures had foretold. And thirdly, it was always to teach a spiritual truth as well. Jesus never did things just haphazard. There was always a plan. There was always a reason. And the apostles took this, these three points, and when they ministered, they continued in the same manner to reveal something, to help people, to, to show them and to point to them that Jesus truly was who he said he was. When the apostles performed these miracles, the same pattern is followed. You see, when you and I are following Jesus, there needs to be a reason why we do the things we do, why we tell people, are we compassionate? Are we reaching out? Are we touching lives? Or do we want to reveal Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the hope of the world? Do we really desire these things, or is it for personal gain? Is it something else? I believe that, that for the apostles and for Jesus, it was always about others. And that's as us as believers. It's always about others. Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus saying, We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Our faith is built on the teachings of the early church, of the apostles, and on the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that the main qualification of, a, of, of an apostle is, do you recall we spoke about this when we were in John? No? Let me remind you. To be an apostle, you have to have been in the presence of Jesus. You have had to have followed him. And so when we talk about the apostles, we recognize that these men were in the presence of Jesus, and so they continued doing the things that Jesus Christ had told them. There are no longer apostles in the church today. L let me clarify this before you get all bent out of shape. and say, the, the ministry of apostle, as we understand it from the scripture, no longer exists in the church. It's done. It's history. Because none of us have seen Jesus Christ firsthand or been with him while he walked on the face of the earth. Do you understand that? In fact, the Bible tells us that in, in the book of Acts, that the qualification of an apostle is that you have had to have been with Christ. When they chose Matthias to, to, to fulfill or, or, to, or to step in, he was part of that group that was following Jesus, and that's why they could call him as an apostle. When you think, well, Paul, what about Paul? Paul was there as well. He encountered Jesus Christ 
firsthand. And so he could call himself an apostle. Today, we have the completed word of God. We don't need this kind of ministry. Now, people say, and you've heard people, well, I'm an apostle. I minister in the ministry of an apostle. There is the ministry of an apostle. There are no apostles, but the ministry of the apostles. Do you understand what I'm saying? And an apostle today would be one who would start new works, who would start a new church down the road, who would start a mission program. They function under the apostolic ministry. And when you see what the apostles did, this is what they did. They went and started works. But there's no quote-unquote apostle in the church today. That it no longer exists. So when someone says, I'm apostle so-and-so, just look at them a little bit funny. You say, okay. Don't get an into an argument. Understand where they're coming from. They may not have a concept or an understanding of what true apostleship is all about. Unless you tell them and you want to play around with them, you say, okay, when did you, when, when did you walk with Jesus for three and a half years? Ooh, ooh, ooh. And they may say, well, I did walk with him because I'm a believer. Well, we all, in other words, all of us then are apostles, right? No. But that ministry per se, has ceased. But the ministry of the apostolic ministry continues as we start new works and we reach out and we function in those. And so when we read that God placed apostles in the church, it is the ministry of apostleship. It's the duty of an apostle, just like pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so on. Um, that's what it's all about. Now, some of you have been reading, and, and so we, we see, and fast forward to where we are today, 2,000 years later, we see what's happening in the world. I was amazed of how much stuff is happening in the world. Um, I was just reading about the Chinese Christian church. Now we all think how powerful that Chinese Christian church. And yet, just in the media, I think I was watching Greta or whatever, and they were showing believers, quote unquote, and I'll put that in parenthesis, Christians killing other people. It was in a McDonald's in some town in China, these people came in, called themselves born-again Christians. They asked this one individual who was at the counter, asked her for, uh, asked, uh, the guy asked her for a phone number. In other words, they want to contact her and make her a convert. She refused to give out her phone number, which was smart. The guy then proceeded, with, the, with, with someone filming this, to beat her to death in the restaurant. That restaurant's been closed for three weeks. This is under the name of Christianity in China. First example. Later on, they interviewed him in, in prison, and he was bragging about it, that he killed this person to make her a convert. And then, because she was evil and didn't want to give the phone number, she deserved to die. And I'm thinking, good night, what kind of Christian are you? Now, you see, when the world sees that kind of action from quote-unquote believers, it's no wonder they shy away from us. No, my, no, it's no wonder that they get scared of Christians. The little bit, the, there was... Just yesterday I was reading, and I added this, Westboro Baptist Church. Maybe some of you have heard of it. But these are the guys who are crazy. Um, don't get confused. They're nuts. They go out and they protest at every single military funeral. And they have all sorts of placards that, that mock God. And God hates this, and God hates that. And the other day, these, these people are absolute haters. And there's no true Christian that would behave in that manner. The latest is that they're going to be protesting at Robin Williams' funeral and saying all sorts of ugly things about him. Where's the witness of Jesus' love in these individuals? And yet there are people that follow these people. You see, there are false teachers and false gospels and false things that are going on. What kind of people are these? These false teachers. And folks, Jesus warned us. He's told us about these things, that these things will happen. This past Thursday, I was watching a guy from Puerto Rico. He's a self-proclaimed second incarnation of Jesus Christ. In fact, he says, I am Jesus, the second coming. He has over a million followers in Central, South, and in Puerto Rico, and across the world. His, the, the, the translation of his um, movement is called... Growing Grace Ministries. Growing Grace Ministries. You can go online. People bow down before Him. They worship Him. They sing praises to Him. And He calls Himself a Christian. He does all sorts of things. The, you be very careful because these individuals are out there. They're pulling the wool over unsuspecting people that really aren't in the Word of God. 
be in the Word of God. Surely they would recognize this. What was funny, he pushed everything aside except the offering. <laughs> then they showed you where he lived. In this exclusive area in Miami. Huge mansion. Over a million dollars worth of it. And I'm thinking, good night, don't you guys get it? Christians, wake up. There are false prophets. There are false teachers. Jesus warned us that there are many false Christs coming in the end times. And these are just a few little things that I've mentioned. Look what it says in Mark chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. Jesus said, For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. Watch out. I have warned you about this ahead of time. Watch out, church. You might be the next one to be deceived if we're not in the Word of God. Always go back to the Word of God to see if these things are so. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I just want to read a few verses to you. Verses 4 through 14. Just those 10 verses. There's a lot in Matthew 24. But we're not going to spend a lot. Again, Jesus told them in verse 4, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic, he says. Man, I'm, it's, it's like I'm reading the paper today when I read this. Because people are flipping out. They're panicking. And he says, don't panic. All right? Because of the wars and rumors of wars. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. And this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. All right? Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. When I read passages like this where Jesus clearly, specifically outlines what will happen prior to his coming, that the love of some will grow cold. In other words, some believers will walk away. I watched an execution this past week of a Christian in northern Syria, just, a, just maybe a week or so ago. It was on one, one of the websites. And the guy was down dressed in jeans, just regular. He looked just like you and I. He could, he could have passed like a, as any American would have. And he's down on his knees and you have this group of terrorists, Muslim terrorists, gathered around him, forcing him to renounce his faith. And also, and there, there were some subtitles, and you know, because it's been edited and show, shown there, and how this man then recanted his faith and said that he believed in the God of, of, of the Muslim faith, of, in, in Allah. Let me tell you, Allah is not the God of the Bible. Please understand, they try to tell you that Allah is the same God of the Christian Bible or the Jewish Bible. Totally different God, a false God. That's what, according to the scriptures, there is no similarity between the God of the Quran or the God of the Bible. Very different. So don't even believe that lie, okay? It's a lie. And so this man then recanted his faith, and they started shouting and dancing around him. One guy comes up behind him, grabs the top of his head, pulls his head back, takes out a knife about this big, and starts cutting. Cut his head off while the guy is alive. And the question is, well, why be the man converted? No, he said he's an infidel. And so they just took him out. This is what's happening right now in northern Iraq. Christians are being killed just be simply because they are Christian. And the article underneath said, may that never be the case in our lives. May we never deny our faith. When, if we ever faced in a situation like that, if you don't know what to say, just recite the Lord's Prayer. Just pray out to God. 
just like Stephen did, and he saw the presence of Jesus just before he died. There are people today dying for their faith, and you see the atrocities that are going on in all places of the world. And when you see the murders and the, and, and the persecution and the threats being made against believers in so many countries, you wonder how far we are along God's timetable. I do. I said, Lord, whereabouts are we? Is it going to get much worse than this? And there's a peace that comes upon me. I said, don't worry. I'm still in control. I know about all these atrocities. We must be in prayer for the believers in these places, praying that they will remain strong and faithful to the Lord. I don't know what happened to that man after he denied the Lord. Jesus said something like that. He says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. And I thought about that as, he, as his head was being taken, being sawn, literally cut off. And I thought, oh Lord, may that never be the case in the believers. Terrorist organizations like ISIS in Iraq and Hamas in Gaza and in the West Bank, Boko Haram in Nigeria and Al-Qaeda, all these organizations in the different parts of the world, these are, terror, these are Islamic terrorist organizations. And if you think that the Quran is a Bible or is a book, a holy book, that teaches love and tolerance, it's the exact opposite. There is no tolerance, there is no love. In fact, you are an enemy of any Muslim. There is no such thing if you're a true Muslim as being moderate. Where is the outcry from the Muslim world of what's happening in the world? It's not there. Because they, if you believe in the Quran, this is what you believe. And I'm a, uh, this is, uh, that's the truth according to the scriptures. I believe not only is, do we face that evil, but then there's the pseudo-Christians. The ones that claim faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, like some of those that I've mentioned, like Westboro Baptist Church, or those Chinese people that say they're Christian and, and they're killing people just, just simply because they refuse to give a phone number. But what about the cults that we face every single day? The ones that knock on your door, called Jehovah's Witnesses, who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. About the Mormons, who say that Jesus was a brother of Lucifer. I, I, and, and that there yeah, are countless millions of people who follow these organizations, saying that they are Christian. There's nothing Christian about them. Absolutely nothing. And folks, you need to be aware of that. That when you confront this, the enemy is trying to water down and dilute the gospel of love. The love of God revealed in the pages of Holy Scripture. Understand that we are in a spiritual fight. We're in a battle for the very soul, for your soul and the soul of America. Or the freedoms that we experience living here. Right now, this is still a great place to live. But we don't know how much longer that's going to be or whether we're going to face persecution. And I don't want to be a prophet of doom. But look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who called you, who revealed himself to you and loved you so much that he gave his life for you. Be aware of these things. You will encounter them if you haven't encountered them. But remember that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. As Christians, we need to press in deeper and deeper in our faith, in our commitment, in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ as we see, see the things of the world becoming war, more and more wor worse. The one individual from ISIS got up and he said, um, the capital of Europe, which is Brussels, you know, for the European um, nations, the capital is Brussels. It used to be a Christian city. Now over 60% of the population in Brussels is Muslim. They said by 2030, that's only 16 years away, folks, that Brussels will be the first Muslim capital in Europe. People, the Christians, are leaving by the droves, leaving Brussels. And he said, not with, without a shot being fired, it will be a Muslim capital of Europe. This is what we're facing. There's no and there and on top of that, Sharia law will be ushered in there. There are places in America where you can go today. If you have, and those of you like beer, those of you have, if you have a six pack and you want to climb in a cab, and the cab driver looks at you and he sees that, he won't allow you to climb into his cab because he's a Muslim. And they're implementing Sharia law. In fact, in Dearborn, there's a movement that 
in a government that's saying that they need to recognize Sharia law amongst the Muslim population. I mean, I, I, I pray that this will never happen. But what we see happening before our eyes, don't be surprised if it ever would perhaps happen. What I lo when I look at Acts and I see the believers and the tenacity that they had and, and the faith that they had in the midst of persecution, it encourages me because I can thrive while facing difficulties. I can live even in the midst of the most adverse circumstances. And I pray for those believers on the top of the mountain. I pray for the believers, those Kurds, that, that, that have their faith. Yes, they're afraid that they might be put to death. But in the midst of that, we need to pray that they have faith and that they keep their faith. Never, never deny your confession of faith, no matter what you may face, no matter how difficult it might be. Sometimes when a person becomes a believer, they ostracize from the family. Don't let it bother you. Press in. Let Jesus encourage you. Those new believers, those believers there in, that, in, in Acts chapter 5, they knew exactly what the apostles had gone through, the difficulties that they'd faced, the persecution that they'd faced. And they knew that because of their new faith, that perhaps they would face the same difficulties in their own lives. They knew that they would face adverse circumstances, and yet they continued proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Notice that they didn't rush and suddenly sign up. Where can I sign up? Some were standing afar off when they were looking. The Bible says they were just observers. But the church was growing in the midst of persecution. The church today, I believe, still exists and still can be powerful when it truly trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we really firmly believe we can rise up, we can be a force for good in the world today. We're not defeated. Jesus' ministry in the church of G of, of, that he built will not be defeated. And in fact, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, that's either Jesus is telling the truth or he, or he was a con artist. I happen to believe that he was the Messiah, the promised one, and that what he said was true. And so when I see about that, but when I see the church... Who is the church? Those who are really faithful. Those who are committed to the cause of the cross. It's not everyone who says Jesus or says I'm a Christian that really is a Christian. It's only those who have been born again by the Spirit of God who are believers. And if you're not born again, you may have a pseudo faith. Like just like many of those that I've just mentioned to you. We must always remember there is a spiritual battle going on. Jim Fox spoke about it last week. There's a battle for your soul, and it's raging in the heavenlies at this very moment. The enemy hates you because you created in the image of God. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image. And so he created man. You are an enemy of Satan, and he wants to destroy you. John 10 says he comes to murder, steal, and destroy. He wants to take you out because God created you. He hates you. And you're facing a spiritual battle this very moment, even while you're sitting here. Further on, we see in God's timetable, I don't know where we are in God's timetable, but as I read that in Matthew 24, and I see the things that are going on, things are not going to get worse. There's not going to be a utopian society as many sci-fi movies portray. It's going to unravel. The world is going to go and be burned up, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth, regardless of what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. There will be a new heavens and a new earth with Jesus in charge. God will reward us for diligently seeking His ways and following His ways. The writer of Hebrews said, It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. If you're not sincerely seeking God, don't expect a reward. If we just tiptoeing through the tulips and thinking everything's fine in the world, you are living in a fool's paradise. But we diligently seek God. We press in to know God. We seek His face. We yearn for His presence in our lives. And I think about the young people who are so oblivious to what is happening in the world, and my heart breaks for them. Because all they're interested is in video games and stuff like that. But they're not interested in the people that are dying at the same age, young, those children. You've seen what's happening in the media. 
Kids being executed. Mothers being taken away and being raped and becoming part of a harem somewhere. And children being killed just simply because they claim faith in Jesus. Now that will never happen in America. Don't be so sure. Don't be so certain of that. The world at large doesn't understand how a life can be totally changed by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so when you talk to people about how what Jesus can do in their lives, they don't get it because they haven't experienced it for themselves. The only way to understand it is to have that spiritual knowledge implanted in your life when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You cannot understand the things of God because they are only spiritually discernible through the Holy Spirit who then lives in the life of a believer. You cannot understand it. So don't be surprised when people don't accept. I truly believe that the dramatic rise of Islam on the world stage is a strategy of the enemy himself. You know, we always thought it was other things, but we see how vicious this movement is. Satan hates the believers in Christ, and he will try his utmost to destroy them, to try and destroy the church. To try and destroy. He will use anything in his arsenal. He will try to use those false religions and cults and leaders and governments and wicked forces to bring about the destruction of Christianity. There are places in Europe where you go and there used to be beautiful churches and stuff. They are now nightclubs, discotheques and stuff like that. Yes, there's a, there is a nucleus of the church, but it's far smaller than what people perceive. Real Christians believes, believers are different from the rest of the world. We have to be different. We, the Bible says that we are peculiar, that we don't do the things that the world does. The early church in the book of Acts was different. It was different from the Jewish religious system. It was also different from the secular religious systems of, of the time, of the Roman faith. In our time today, Believers must still be different. We must be separate from the world. Our Christian lifestyle and commitment to God separates us from the world because we don't do the things that the world does. We don't practice the things that the world practices. We are different. God calls us to be a holy people, a people after His own heart. So we don't do and behave like the world does. And if we do, then there's something wrong in our commitment. The Christian lifestyle shall be radically different from all the lifestyles and religions of the world. True faith, true Christianity is what God is looking for. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, says, Therefore come out from among them, uh, from among unbelievers, and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We have to be different. We have to live the life that God calls us to. We cannot schmooze around with the world because inevitably you will become just like them and you will lose the testimony that God calls us to live for. Folks, God calls us to press in as we see things getting worse and worse. He said to the believers in Rome, Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. We are flirting with the world. So many of us are flirting with the world. And God calls us to be different, to be separate and not be like the world. Your body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service to Him. That's why God accepts us. He expects us to be different. He expects us to live holy lives and not be like the world. Are we perfect? Of course not. Then He says in that same passage, Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And you will, then you will learn... To know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Only as we do this do we come to experience God's will for our lives. Is when we don't mess with the world. Another reason I think Christians are persecuted in the world is because we reach out and we try to tell people about Jesus. Because Jesus said, go into all the world. He said that in Acts chapter 1. What exactly is evangelism? Does it mean to say we have to all go knock on doors 
It might be for you. But it's telling people about the hope that the world can experience. The hope that is found in Jesus Christ. You're an evangelist wherever you are. Whether you're at work, whether you're at school, wherever you might be. You're an evangelist. Telling people and living the life and being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. The world believes that there are many ways to reach God. You can try this way or that way. And I always kid around, yeah, they all reach God. But when you stand in front of God, God says, I don't know you, depart from me. I don't know you, depart from me. Oh, I know you, I welcome you. But everyone will stand before God one day. Each one of us will give an account of their lives. You will stand before God. I will stand before God. Every single human being will give an account. Remember what Peter said. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no, name un, uh, no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. You won't be saved through some prophet. You won't be, be saved through some cult. You won't be saved through some other world religion. You will only be saved by the name that is above every other name, uh, by the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Period. Whether you accept that or not, that's besides the point. Take it up with Jesus when you talk to Him one day. But according to the Scriptures, there is no other way. And unless we turn and change our ways and follow Jesus, I'm not saying that you become perfect, but with God's help and our obedience to the Spirit of God living in us, He shapes us and forms us into the men and women and young people He wants us to go. And as long as the religions of the world dictate to their followers as in the case of Islam, or on the other hand, allow people to do just as they please, there will be a sense of security, a sense of well-being, a, a, a sense of just laid-backness to do as you please. The world mocks and opposes the idea that Christ is the only Savior of the world. This is obvious because of what we see happening before us. People laugh at you. It's okay. Let them laugh at you. At the end of the day, God has the last laugh. The world systems and the religious religions of the world reject the mission and the commitment of believers. They try to erase the message of Jesus Christ from the world. We've seen it happen in our school system that you can't pray and that you can't um, proclaim Christ in the school system. We see it happening right before our very eyes, living right here. Yet, if and when we face the oppositions and persecutions, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel, but recognize and remember the Lord's words that He gave us a heads up about this. He said that these things will happen. And when they happen, don't be surprised that they are happening. The church in Acts chapter 5 was a powerful witness to the Holy Spirit's power at work. Is this what's happening in the church today? Is the church a powerful witness for Christ? Is East Rockway Nazarene Church a powerful witness for Christ? Is what's happening in Acts chapter 5 happening in the church today? Yes, in the face of persecution, do we rise up and do we thrive? Everything that happens in the church, when, when the apostles performed miracles and people were healed and people were set free and people were set free from demonic possession and oppression, is that happening in the church today? It should be. As we seek God fa God's face, I believe that the church today should still continue in the same vein as the early church did. Powerfully equipped by the Holy Spirit. And it's only as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit that these miraculous signs will occur. It's only as we surrender our lives 100% wholeheartedly to the Lord that God can then release His power in our lives. People are still ill today. People are still sick People are still possessed. People are still in need of the Lord's healing touch in their bodies, in their minds, in their relationships, in their hearts. God still desires to do a work in the lives of people. And He'll do it through you. He'll do it through me. He'll do it through us as a congregation as we trust Him. And we rise up and we say, yes, Lord, count me in, in this journey you've called me to. Luke tells us, that the sick were laid in Peter's path so that his shadow might fall on them. Wow, they believed that even that would bring about healing. Sick people were healed and those possessed by evil spirits, the Bible says, was, were delivered. 
There is a thing like demon possession. It is still happening today. And a lot of the world that says that that's just psychology, don't believe it. Yes, there are problems. There are physical problems, maybe like brain damage and so on. But there is also the spiritual aspect, and we cannot neglect the spiritual aspect of psychological problems that the world says are psychological. People say that certain things that a person struggles with have been changed in the medical journals, and they say, well, that's no longer a, 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 a psychological problem. It's just inherent of mankind. Don't believe just because some people say it is so. Go back to the Scriptures and see what the Bible says and trust God's Word first and foremost. I believe a scary church is a thriving church and it needs to be a healing church. That this place needs to be a hospital where sick people can come in and where they will find Jesus Christ and they will discover there is healing. I can find solace here i can find comfort i can find the presence of god amongst these people i want what they have and what we have and what you have is jesus christ never let go hang on to the lord with all your strength and all your might and no matter how difficult the situation may be that you might be facing or whether it is in the form of persecution or in the form of sickness or demonic attack you can thrive while being threatened throughout these things don't give up. You can still thrive in the midst of the most adverse circumstances. I want us again this morning, if you can take out your phones, those of you who have your phones, and tweet this. Despite circumstances, I can thrive while being threatened. Now, whatever you are threatened by, broken relationships, persecution at work, maybe in your own family, Maybe you're facing hardship in your life. Maybe you're facing difficulties. I don't know what you all are going through. But we all will face circumstances in our lives. But what do we do in the midst of those circumstances? We can choose to live for God and still proclaim His greatness and His glory. Or we can choose to succumb and just throw in the towel like that man who denied the Lord and had his head taken off. What will we do with Jesus? We can thrive in the midst of difficulties. We can thrive in the midst of while being threatened. We, those believers in northern Iraq, those in northern Nigeria, those in, in the Sudan, those in, in Ethiopia, those in Somalia, those in North Korea, those in China, those in Myanmar, all the places where Christians are being persecuted for their faith, those in Indonesia, all these places in Central America simply because of our profession of faith are being persecuted. We're living in a very, very hard time. Praise God we live in the United States. I thank God for that every day. But be vocal about your faith. Don't just sit back and say, I can't do anything about anything. You can tell someone about Jesus. And you can thrive. And you know what a blessing it is to witness and to tell someone? You know, even in the midst of a hardship, in the midst of circumstances, God is still faithful. And He will bring you through. And He will lift you up. And He will carry you. And there will come a day when you will stand before Him, as I will, as all of us will. And the books are opened. Make sure your name is there. And he sees and he says to you, well done, well done, come and be with me. Jesus, thank you.